free speech is a delicate, delicate flower. We were Americans. We were concerned about the problems of our country. And we spoke to those problems. We addressed those problems. We, we, we tried to enlist people to support us on what we thought was a solution for those problems. They were granted the, uh, the option of either co cooperating, either with, with the United States, the greatest, most wonderful country in the world, or cooperating with the enemy, who was to, whose aim was to destroy this country. Supposedly, we have the freedom that people can believe anything they want to in this country. You can even say anything you want to in this country with certain limits. So they had a right to believe or to say whatever they wanted to about the Soviet Union. That wasn't a crime. They didn't break the law. What did they do that was so terrible? America prepares to face attack on its cities and industrial centers under a combined civilian defense program. Any community is vulnerable to possible bombing, including the final threat of the devastating atom. A screen of Air Force units goes into action to protect our borders from the unannounced arrival of the enemy. The enemy who apparently knows no mercy and who has signified his intention to conquer the world under the banner of communist imperialism. All over the In the nation, 1950s, no enemy of the United States was more clearly or universally defined than communism. Labeled the single greatest threat to freedom and democracy, communism came to represent anything alien to American values. But in the rush to purge communists from American society, a conflict ensued with the most fundamental principles of a democracy. For communists in America, exercising the right to freedom of speech became a dangerous act. From the moment of the Russian Revolution in 1917, America had been on guard. In January 1920, U.S. Attorney General Mitchell Palmer rounded up thousands of suspected communists and radicals in carefully staged raids across the country. Nearly 300 were taken in New Hampshire. 140 were arrested in Nashua alone, the largest single arrest in the country. Others were arrested in Manchester, Claremont, Berlin, Lincoln, Portsmouth, and Derry. They were chained and taken by special train to Deer Island, Massachusetts, where many were held for several months. During the Great Depression in the 1930s, communism attained a brief moment of tolerance in America. Its membership ranks grew as people in desperate economic conditions grasped at any movement promising to better their situation. The party gained a measure of respectability, even fielding candidates for public office. In 1934 and 1938, Elba Chase was the Communist Party candidate for governor of New Hampshire, the first woman ever to have her name on the ballot for that office. In her best run, she received just 244 votes. Fleeing before the victorious Russians, Nazis take cattle and everything movable before applying the torch and dynamite to all installations. During World War II, communists and Americans united together in the fight against Nazi Germany. But within a year after the war's end, communists and the Soviet Union were portrayed once again as enemies of America and freedom. Their goal is the overthrow of our government. There is no doubt as to where a real communist loyalty rests. Their allegiance is to Russia, not the United States. Communism in reality is not a political party. It is a way of life, an evil and malignant way of life. It reveals a condition akin to disease that spreads like an epidemic. And like an epidemic, a quarantine is necessary to keep it from infecting this nation. Suddenly, there were suspected communists everywhere. James O'Neill, police chief of Manchester and commander of the New Hampshire chapter of the American Legion, suggested that there were as many as 10,000 communists in New Hampshire alone. In Washington, D.C., the House Un-American Activities Committee of Congress set a tone bordering on inquisition. At widely publicized hearings, high in drama, the committee attempted to expose communist spies and infiltrators from Hollywood to Washington. 
Who's the Liar? might well be the title of the drama which unfolds before a packed caucus room where the House Un-American Affairs Committee members swear in Alger Hiss, former State Department executive. Mr. Hiss is accused of being a former communist and before news cameras faces his accuser. Mr. Crosley Chambers, in my presence, before the subcommittee, I first knew him as Crosley. What his name is today, I am not prepared to testify to, or what other names he may have had. When I joined the YCL, I was told, now, your membership is going to be secret. I said, wait a minute, you know, what, 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 what's all this all about? First organization I joined like that. But your membership is going to be secret, and furthermore, Furthermore, if anyone ever uh, accuses you of being in, in, in the Young Communist League, you ought to deny it. You ought to swear on a stack of Bibles that high that you never have been a uh, member, member of the Young Communist League. The anti-communist drive in New Hampshire had two powerful and outspoken advocates. First was the American Legion and its state commander, James O'Neill. Second was the Manchester Union leader. The paper had been recently purchased by William Loeb, who was seeking to expand its political influence and put his personal stamp on its editorial positions. The strong advocacy of Loeb, his paper, O'Neill and the Legion, reinforced by what was happening nationally, prompted the state legislature in 1949 to create a commission that would look into communist activity in the state. <laughs> In 1950, men throughout the world learned to look on the brutal face of communism. Berlin, powder keg of Europe, saw a mass demonstration of indoctrinated young Germans on May Day. France was also beset by communist-inspired strife. But far more sinister to Americans was home front communism. Union Square in New York was the backdrop for these scenes of red violence. From their ranks will come the saboteurs, spies, and subversives should World War III be forced upon America. But there was worse to come. A highly trained and well-equipped North Korean army swarmed across the 38th parallel to attack unprepared South Korean defenders. Caught off guard, they were all but overwhelmed until the United Nations took its historic vote to intervene. While the Korean Republicans... The communist invasion of South Korea in 1950 turned up the heat in what was becoming known as the Cold War. When added to the communist victory of Mao Zedong in China, and even more importantly, the development of the atomic bomb by the Soviet Union, an ominous message was being sent to the American people. Congress responded by passing the Internal Security Act of 1950. It created a framework for the possible roundup and detention in concentration camps of communists and other subversives. The anti-communist movement also gained a new leader, Senator Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin, whose name would become synonymous with the era. And you have the distinction of having coined uh, a new word for the dictionary, namely McCarthyism. Now, uh, how do you define McCarthyism, sir? Mr. Huey, I didn't, I didn't uh, coin the phrase. But putting it the way one columnist did the other day, he said, apparently McCarthyism means calling a man a communist who is later proven to be one. Do you think that you have been guilty of any un-Americanism yourself in, uh, in your efforts to combat what you define as un-Americanism? If uh, fighting communists and getting a bit rough with them, uh, Mr. Huey, is un-American, then I must plead guilty to be un-American. Do you think that you used any... By publicly trumpeting allegations against people, often based on innuendo and rumor, McCarthy's investigatory methods had a chilling effect on free speech across the country. No one wanted to risk being tainted as communist. In contrast to McCarthy, the State Legislative Commission created in 1949 to investigate communist activities in New Hampshire did its work quietly and out of the public eye. In 1950, it issued a report concluding there was no communist problem in New Hampshire. Not everyone agreed. Prodded by William Loeb of the Manchester Union Leader, the legislature passed in 1951 a Subversive Activities Act for New Hampshire. It outlawed the Communist Party, as well as other unnamed, potentially subversive organizations. The act also outlawed individual advocacy of subversive ideas and required a written loyalty oath from all state employees and candidates for public office.
I think that it served a lot of purposes. Um, one purpose it served was to enable the, um, the right wing to gain more control of more power in this country. They had kind of lost it during the Depression and under Roosevelt. And they didn't like that. They didn't like all that was done for the people in that time. So that uh, they were hoping to get more power back. And they, in fact, did so by using the communist scare, by the war in Korea so that they could build up a huge military system, by beginning maybe to go to war elsewhere against the communists, by having an enemy, um, it could strengthen patriotism for the United States, but it gave them a very good weapon against the Democrats so that the Republicans could maintain and increase their own power. In addition to the highly publicized investigations in Washington, by 1953, 12 states had initiated their own special investigations into communist activities. And in the spring of 1953, the New Hampshire legislature again took up the issue. In June, they appropriated $10,000 for New Hampshire Attorney General Lewis Wyman to conduct an investigation into violations of the 1951 Subversive Activities Law. The legislature wanted to know, were there any communists in New Hampshire? If so, what were they up to? And what had they done? And uh, that's what we tried to find out. If you assume these people are members of the Communist Party, then they stand four square for overthrowing our country by force and violence. That's what they believed in. That was one of their precepts. They had to accept that to be a card-carrying member of the party. I can show you the things they had to swear to. There was an oath they had to take. So as a leader and organizer of the proletariat, the Communist Party of the United States leads in the fight for the revolutionary overthrow of capitalism, which means the use of force and violence, for the establishment of the dictatorship of the proletariat, that's what they call the, the, the communist system, for the establishment of a socialist Soviet republic in the United States. Very, very clear that that was their hope and their aim and their goal in the long, in the long run. The same social concerns I had then, I still have now. I'm concerned about the homeless. I'm concerned about health care. I'm concerned about peace. I'm concerned about the underprivileged. I'm concerned about the, what's happening with our country. I was concerned then, I'm still concerned that today. It isn't enough merely to say, I love America and to salute the flag and take off your hat as it goes by and to help sing the Star Spangled Banner. On Sunday, June 14, 1953, President Dwight Eisenhower was the commencement speaker at Dartmouth College. He used the occasion to lash out for the first time at McCarthyism. He challenged the graduates to expand their minds and not cave in to the book burners. Among those on stage with Eisenhower was New Hampshire Governor Hugh Gregg, who had served with the Army Counterintelligence Corps, investigating subversive activities in the military during World War II and the Korean War. Three days after Eisenhower's speech, Governor Gregg signed into law the bill requiring the Attorney General's office to investigate subversive activities in New Hampshire. We need to do all we could to expose communism for what it was, and for the public to realize the dangers were uh, potentially there to destroy our own country. Either on our side or their side, you know, period. No, no, great, no great problem. Uh, either you are either you for a system of slavery and totalitarian and dictatorship and death, uh, or, or they're on the side of a country that advocates freedom, that preserves freedom, that promotes freedom, that grants people freedom. Gives you all the rights in the world. Uh, 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 to me, it's a very clear decision. To oversee the probe, Wyman hired Stuart Connor, an ex FBI agent experienced in the investigation of subversive organizations. Rules of procedure were also issued as Wyman attempted to assure the public that this would not be a McCarthy type investigation. Some of the exchanges which we all witnessed on television at the time troubled me greatly because I considered them to be overreaching by Senator McCarthy. But uh, I was in no way involved with him. I just wanted to be very careful to see that the investigation which we conducted 
in New Hampshire uh, did not uh, push people around and unfairly transgress on their, on their rights. Despite Wyman's concerns, the constant drumbeat of the union leader and William Loeb was creating its own momentum. On November 18, 1953, Senator McCarthy even came to New Hampshire to speak at a Knights of Columbus meeting in Dover. That same week in Meredith, concern about a possible communist teacher brought over 100 parents to a special meeting. Piazzi Querum taught history at Meredith High School. Because his lessons included Russian history, rumors spread that he was a communist. They proved to be only rumors. The parents ended up apologizing and gave him a standing ovation of support. The rumors, however, persisted. A week later, he resigned. In a letter to the school board, Quirum said the only way he would be able to find peace of mind and the right to live as a free citizen was to leave Meredith High School and perhaps the profession of teaching forever. The state, as I said, was highly conservative, highly... Um oriented toward personal types of patriotism uh, and people responded positively to this probe for the most part and, and certainly that worked to the advantage of the politicians when they went out there and could say I fought for this probe, I was alongside Louis Wyman. Clergy, educators, politicians all joined the anti-communist drive. Tom McIntyre, Democratic candidate for Congress, praised Senator McCarthy and his investigation. The New Hampshire Bar Association submitted names of prospective lawyers for Wyman to check for possible communist affiliation. A janitor at Dartmouth College kept track of professors who had communist literature in their offices and reported this information to the investigation. City dwellers, office workers, housewives, service personnel must be constantly alert, must report anyone distributing hostile propaganda. Fishermen, coastal workers, people on vacation should be on the lookout for any evidence of surreptitious landings. The farmer, the hunter, people who live in isolated areas should report any evidence indicating parachute landings. Mindful still of Pearl Harbor, the United States was a country determined never again to be unprepared. But in so doing, America was becoming a society bound in a permanent state of war. As is often the case in times of war, this helped create a justification for the abridgment of civil liberties. America, trying to protect itself, edged away from its most basic and fundamental principle. Freedom of speech and freedom of association were being perverted by fear. So that Americans everywhere going about their daily business can give us a few more million eyes with which to strengthen the peace and security of our nation. Civil defense drills became common practice. People were encouraged to build bomb shelters in their homes or at a minimum know where their nearest public shelter was. In October 1953, the Union leader surveyed its readers the question, do you think Russia will blast the United States with hydrogen or atomic bombs. Here's Tony going to his Cub Scout meeting. Tony knows the bomb can explode any time of the year, day or night. He is ready for it. Duck and cover. At a boy, Tony. That flash means act fast. Tony knows that it helps to get to any kind of cover. This wall was close by, so that's where he ducked and covered. Tony knew what to do. Notice how he keeps from moving or from getting up and running. He stays down until he is sure the danger is over. In fact, we were, caught, we were taught that, to, that we had to be like Stalin, disciplined, steeled. Stalin of the land of steel. And every communist has to think in that way. Hard, 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 cold, ice cold. Dirk Stork, I mentioned him before. Believe me, Dirk Stork has ice water for blood. And, and as you sit there in the cell meetings, meeting with these people, I can tell you, the hair begins to crawl up in your neck. You are meeting with people who have criminal minds and will use criminal means to achieve their ends. It's a frightening business. I didn't know whether individuals were a threat or not. 
But if they acted like a duck and sounded like a duck and quacked like a duck and walked on water or paddled on water, uh, one would have to conclude that uh, perhaps they had an affinity with ducks. And uh, uh, Elba Chase Nelson was an acknowledged uh, member of the Communist Party and as such a target of an investigation into subversive activities at that time. Elba Chase Nelson of Washington, New Hampshire, had been the leader of the Communist Party in the state until it was outlawed in 1951. She had joined the party in the 1920s with her first husband, Fred Chase, whose grave in a Washington cemetery is marked by a hammer and sickle. She and several family members were the first to be subpoenaed by the Attorney General. And she needed to get a lawyer. So she wrote to the head of the Bar Association, John McLean, and said, could you help me? I need a lawyer, and I don't know whom to write to, and I have no money. Um, do you know who might be able to help me? And John McLean sent back a very nice letter and said that, um, in fact, that if she wished, his firm would represent her and would do so free of charge. At 10 a.m., December 7, 1953, Nelson, with her attorney, New Hampshire Bar Association President John McLean, appeared in Wyman's office, saying the investigation was a violation of her rights under the United States Constitution. She refused to answer any questions. The stage shifted to Merrimack County Superior Court, where on the witness stand she again refused to answer Wyman's questions. The judge found her in contempt and ordered her to jail. McLean asked for bail while an appeal was filed. It was denied. He quickly moved to get justices of the state Supreme Court to stay the order. Chief Justice Frank Kennison refused. McLean evidently really went crazy, according to newspaper reporters, and is quoted as saying, my clients don't go to jail, you know, but he never expected her to go to jail. And she, in fact, had not brought an overnight bag or anything. At 7.15 that evening, just nine hours after she had walked into Wyman's State House office, Elba Chase Nelson was booked into the Hillsborough County Jail. McLean and his wife brought over a bag with a nightgown and a toothbrush and, you know, soap and whatever she would need. And the story was that the jailer was horrified that he was going to have this, you know, what, 60-year-old grandmother in his jail. People sort of knew her, and she had a very ladylike demeanor. They said she talked like a duchess. So the story was that he ran out and he bought fresh sheets and a tea set and, and uh, all this nice stuff for her so that her jail would be nice. The next day, Nelson returned to Merrimack County Superior Court. This time she used her right under the Fifth Amendment not to incriminate herself and thus was released from the contempt charge. Though Wyman learned little by jailing Elba Chase Nelson, he had sent an important message to future recalcitrant witnesses. I don't think we ever used what could be described as heavy-handed means with anybody. It was very simple, basically. Uh, if it were you, and I'm asking you, well, uh, you were a member of the XYZ organization, were you not? This in this instance, the Communist Party, and uh, you said yes. Well, who was with you? I refuse to answer. I'm not going to inform on others. You're getting close to the uphouse situation now. And uh, you have that right to take that position. I have the duty, or at that time had the duty, for the legislature uh, of uh, compelling you to respond. In 1954, a steady stream of witnesses were called by the Attorney General. However, unlike investigations in the nation's capital, Wyman questioned his witnesses during executive sessions held in his office. There were no public hearings. But witnesses who were less than cooperative often found the transcript of these proceedings released to the public. They were scared. They were mostly, it was fear, it was uh, anxiety. Um, what I noticed, uh, what I would say, what I noticed most was fear going in and tears coming out. On the family, the general impact of all of this was that um, people couldn't earn a living. And that had a terrible impact on families. Um, my father not being able to get a job, 
My step-grandfather was, um, the FBI purposefully saw that he lost his job carrying mail so that my grandmother's main source of income, her husband's salary, was lost. While I knew I was doing a job and while I was trying my best to be objective about it, there was a certain guilt I felt at not speaking up and not speaking out and not raising my voice and saying this was wrong. Uh, I don't think anyone, uh, with the possible exception of perhaps the union leader, was taking a great deal of pleasure in what was happening to these people. But I say this, that, 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 that from someone sincerely believing in freedom, sincerely being against fascism, against Nazism, against totalitarianism, against dictatorship, should have no reason not to say, hey, I'm willing to help in defending that freedom and preserving that freedom, the most wonderful thing in the world we have today. Uh, I can't, I can't understand why anybody would be, be reluctant not to do so, unless they had something to hide, unless they had something to hide. As the investigation progressed, it expanded beyond suspected communists and took a particularly close look at the state's institutions for higher learning. In so doing, it cast its gaze on Paul Sweezy. A native of Wilton, Sweezy was active in the Progressive Party, editor of the Monthly Review, and considered the foremost Marxist economist in the country. Gwyn Daggett, a professor at the University of New Hampshire, invited Paul Sweezy to give a lecture on Marxism at UNH. Wyman subpoenaed both Sweezy and Daggett, demanding to know the content of the lecture. They both refused to answer, citing the First Amendment and academic freedom. Of course, there were, <laughs> there were 150 kids sitting there listening who were willing to tell the Attorney General anything he really wanted to know about socialism or what Sweezy had said. But he didn't want that. He wanted to chase Daggett and, and Sweezy. Oh, we tried. We asked students what he said. We had information from others as to what he had said. The best way to find out what he had said, I thought and still think, uh, is to ask him. This is none of his business. The government has no business inquiring into those things. That was a matter of principle. This was political association and freedom of, and, and, uh, and academic thought. And the government, this is an absolutely crucial principle of civil liberties, that uh, the government, freedom of speech and freedom of association. That, so there wasn't any choice in the matter if you were going to take a stand on First Amendment ground. First, we went to the Supreme Court to get a temporary stay to try to get the Supreme Court to, to order Judge Griffith uh, not, not to uh, pursue the matter. And uh, while we were in the Supreme Court chambers, a messenger came over from the governor's office telling Mr. Daggett that if he didn't answer the questions, he was going to get fired. The governor's job is to support the whatever the concepts and the precepts and the laws are is defined by the legislature. And Louis was doing a job that he was instructed to do, so of course I helped him whenever I could. And these people that uh, took a contrary view, they have a right to their opinion, but they shouldn't stand in the way of what was trying to be accomplished. Oh, Daggett was raring to go. He, he, he wanted to tell the governor to drop dead and, and, answer, and refuse to answer the questions. But he had a wife and three children, and I said to him, don't be crazy, you don't want to lose your job. You probably would lose your job if you didn't answer the questions. Without Daggett, Sweezy pursued his case through the courts. On June 17, 1957, a divided United States Supreme Court ruled in favor of Paul Sweezy. Now you see what the four members were trying to do, was to, were trying to afford protection to more than Professor Sweezy more than people who were sitting in the academic community who might be able to rely upon academic freedom. They were looking at the structure 
of that investigation and trying to and trying to provide some constitutional guidelines that would have afforded much broader protection but they were unable to persuade the fifth vote uh, so they, they got their fifth and sixth vote not because there was agreement on the power of the uh, of the legislature or the power of the attorney general but because the other two votes focused very tightly on the facts of professor sweezy's case and on his particular activities as a lecturer and as a member of the progressive party so uh, the net result was that the case ended up prof protecting Professor Sweezy and maybe some other professors, but it didn't end up protecting a number of other people who could not lay claim to academic freedom as the, as the basis for barring the state from, from making inquiry. The Bill of Rights, either it means what it says, in which case people have to fight for it and struggle to keep it going, or it'll erode, and first thing you know, we won't have any Bill of Rights anymore. On January 5th, 1955, Attorney General Wyman issued his report to the legislature. After 15 months of investigation costing the state $31,500, employing two full-time investigators, and questioning under oath 131 witnesses, the Attorney General had found no violations of the state's subversive activities law. The best he could come up with was a list of 30 people who had refused to answer his questions, you citing their constitutional grounds to do so. And from that point on, the only purpose of that investigation was to get, was to harass the people who defied him. Paul Sweezy, Will House, Hugo de Gregory. He made three famous, three cases of people he tried to put in jail, not because they were communists. Will House, no one ever claimed he was a communist. No one ever claimed that Sweezy was a communist party member, but only because they defied Louis Wyman in his witch hunt in New Hampshire. Uh, when you explain that I'm not the attorney general for this purpose, I'm a legislative committee, uh, you are simply saying the same thing to the legislature. Yes, I am. You have no right to even ask me such questions. I am not going to answer, and so on. Well, when that happens, you have to go to court. But with individuals like that, uh, who deeply feel, whether justifiable or not, that way, you're always going to have confrontation. With the support of newly elected Governor Lane Dwinnell, the 1955 legislature appropriated $42,000 to continue the investigation. From that point on, most of the activity of the investigation would be in courtrooms, trying to force uncooperative witnesses to cooperate but an extensive covert surveillance operation was also continued. They had an informer at my place where I worked who was supposed to inform me. They had one of my neighbors lined up. They had people across the pond from where I lived with cameras with, long, with telephoto lenses trying to take pictures of important communists coming to my place. And they see a woman come with a child, and they follow the woman and the child, and they end up in an ice cream parlor. It ended up in the dead letter office. Uh, and the postage is due. If you got 25 cents, you can have it. So he probably, 25 cents was a lot of money then, but he, he said it was the best 25 cents he ever paid. He gave him the 25 cents and um, opens up this thing, and it's a transcript of his phone calls. Um, and I don't know what it said exactly, but it was his regular old phone calls, like he'd call his mother and say, okay, I'll be down, you know, I know you need help with that cow. I'll be there around two if I get off, you know, from work early enough. Um, and it was all transcribed. And what Elba said back to him and so forth. And then supposedly, and I was never able to see this, um, on the bottom of the page there was an attempt made to interpret the code. Like the cow was Khrushchev and the this was that, <laughs> you know. And they thought it was a secret code, you know, hey, Mom, come down and milk the cow, that meant something. I don't recall that we were invading anybody's rights. We were operating under the statute. We never trespassed on their property. Uh, if you had a source of information and you were seeking certain information as to who was at a meeting or at the house or whether there was a Communist Party meeting, you didn't, you didn't order that person to go in there. If that person was going to go to the meeting, then they would go there voluntarily. 
So I don't see where that was any infringement on anybody's rights. If people refused to go or didn't want to seek the information, then you, were, you just were not going to get it. And uh, certainly if you had, if you subpoenaed to Gregory and asked him about specific meetings and who was there, uh, he was not going to answer the question anyway. Now, I was not aware this was going on. I sensed it was going on. And I always enjoyed the fact that we lived one and a half miles from the state line because we could drive that one, that, it was not, a, it was half a mile from the state line. We could drive that half mile, take a deep breath and say, this is a, the free state of Massachusetts. We don't have to worry down here. You know, a lot of people behind the Iron Curtain are wondering whether we can take it if we're attacked. They're carefully measuring our courage, our capacity to fight, our capacity for sacrifice. They think they have the answers. Well, you and I and every American has to examine their minds and hearts and come up with a few answers of their own. The question is, have Americans got the guts? Have you got the guts? Throughout the 1950s, Americans continued to prepare for what loomed as an inevitable war against communism. And world events continued to affirm that preparation. In Hungary, an anti-communist revolt was brutally put down by Soviet troops in 1956. Even more alarming, the Soviets were taking the lead in the race for space, putting satellites in Earth orbit, when America had trouble just getting rockets off the launch pad. In New Hampshire, the battle against communism was now taking place in the courtroom, and it was being waged in the context of the Bill of Rights to the Constitution. The role, the central role for the Constitution is to afford a set of limitations that act as a a bar, a break, a check on the exercise of government power. And government power is usually the majority acting through the legislature. So you can say that the Constitution is a, a safeguard against majority uh, abuse of, of individuals and minority interests. Freedom of speech does have some limitations, and those limitations, in my view, extend to uh, incitement to force of violence, whether in connection with a subversive operation or a riot or what have you. If you were quite willing to talk about the party, what you did, your activities, everything, you were willing to talk about it, about anything that you did, um, you still couldn't do it because they would force you then, once you started talking, you had to answer all the questions, and those questions would include who else was at the meeting, what are their names, what are their addresses, and you had to finger other people. I went to a hearing. I answered questions like, have you ever advocated the overthrow of the government? Absolutely no. I did not refuse to answer any questions concerning my political activities. I did not think the state had a right to know. That was my constitutional right to express myself any way I pleased. I refused to uh, say whether I knew some people. I used my constitutional right not to point the finger at people I considered innocent of anything. And uh, then he issued me, he told me I was on remaining on a continuing subpoena and that he was going to go to the state, of, to the, to the uh, legislature and get an immunity law passed that would compel me to testify. The fifth article of the Bill of Rights protects a person from self-incrimination. For Wyman, it was an obstruction, keeping him from the information he wanted. And so he asked for, and the legislature empowered him with, the ability to grant immunity. What the grant of immunity does is it says, okay, we're going to honor your right. You can't be prosecuted for what you testify to. But we're going to grant you immunity. Now you can't be prosecuted, therefore you now must testify. On December 19, 1956, Hugo de Gregory was on the witness stand in Merrimack County Superior Court. In spite of the grant of immunity, he refused to answer the Attorney General's questions. He was found in contempt, denied bail, and taken to the Merrimack County Jail. They wanted me to finger people, to say that I knew so-and-so, or so-and-so. And by knowing them, they would be tarnished. They would be incriminated. They would be 
get a subversive tag because I knew them. I acknowledged knowing them. I decided I was not going to do that. On January 3, 1957, de Gregory's attorney, future Congressman James Cleveland, convinced the state Supreme Court to grant bail while challenges to the state's immunity law were pursued. And the two weeks of confinement were made easier by a sympathetic jailer who decided to leave de Gregory's cell door open. Now here was, this, here was the entire state of New Hampshire coming at me. The legislature, the attorney general's office, the courts, all united, got me into jail. And here's the jailer, the point of the whole triangle, the man with the whip. He was a little short guy, about five feet high, a bandy-legged Irishman. And he says, you, this is my jail, I'm going to run it the way I want it. He was a human being. I knew that, for example, uh, for the summer vacations and for outings and for other things, uh, the communists in Boston would come up here to New Hampshire to a place called World Fellowship, a camp up near Conway, or North Conway in that area. And uh, there they would hold meetings and get-togethers and all sorts of uh, things going on. So I suggested to Louis he might take a look at World Fellowship and see what, the, what was the attraction. The World Fellowship Center was, and still is, a conference center located in Albany, New Hampshire. From the very beginning of the investigation in 1953, World Fellowship and its director, Willard Uphouse, were a primary focus of the Attorney General. Wyman even went so far as to have an informer spend a summer at the center. Uphouse, a minister and lifelong peace activist, at first tried to cooperate with the investigation. But when Wyman demanded his personal correspondence and a list of all who had stayed at World Fellowship, Uphouse refused. But he felt that he would not become an informer uh, on other people and that this was making him an informer and a traitor and, uh, and uh, uh, a person that uh, was hypocritical and so forth. So he felt a Christian responsibility. He was a devout Christian. He felt a Christian responsibility not to bear false witness against a neighbor or a fellow man. There was no way, you want to remember this, that the legislature, and again this was a delegated legislative committee, there was no way the legislature could find out who was there unless he answered the question. And this had substantial ramifications because we had information at that time that uh, here was a place where there might really be some connection, some liaison with uh, communists outside of the state of New Hampshire and throughout the nation. The appeals of Willard Uphouse and Hugo de Gregory eventually worked their way up to the United States Supreme Court. In June of 1959, the High Court handed down its decision. In both cases, the court ruled in favor of Attorney General Wyman. President Nixon escorts Soviet Premier Khrushchev on a preview of the United States Fair at Skolniki Park in Moscow. It's the official opening of the American Exposition, counterpart of the Soviet trade show in New York, and dedicated to showcasing the highest standard of life in our country. But on this occasion, traditional diplomacy goes by the board, and the story of the fair itself is eclipsed by a crackling exchange between Nixon and Khrushchev, begun off camera and finished off before the American Ampex color videotape recorders. Every aspect of the Cold War and Soviet-American rivalry is argued in blunt and forthright terms. The threat of atomic warfare, diplomacy by ultimatum, economic progress. Huh? Says Mr. Key, the Soviet will overtake America and then wave bye-bye. Richard Nixon began his rise in politics as a congressman and member of the House Un-American Activities Committee. But in the summer of 1959, as vice president, he became the highest ranking American official to travel to the Soviet Union since the revolution of 1917. America had not defeated communism on the world stage, but was beginning to accept it as part of the world order. In the fall of 1959, Premier Nikita Khrushchev 
traveled to the United States, the first leader of the Soviet Union to do so. But these breakthroughs in U.S.-Soviet relations had little effect on the investigations of subversive activities in New Hampshire. At that time, I felt there had been uh, some communists up there, others who were uh, what you might call at that time fellow travelers went along with them, and we wanted to know what they were up to. That's what the legislature had directed us to find out and report back which is what we were trying to do. But until you know who was there, you couldn't find out who, what they were up to. Having lost his case before the nation's highest court, Willard Uphouse was again subpoenaed to appear at the Merrimack County Superior Court with the guest list for World Fellowship. In the days preceding the court date, Governor Wesley Powell's office was flooded with mail, pleading for him to intervene on Uphouse's behalf. It was to no avail. On December 14, 1959, 69-year-old Willard Uphouse appeared in the Merrimack County courtroom. I mean, it didn't take very long. The argument took longer than the questions. All he asked was, uh, would you produce the list? And Uphouse said, no, I won't produce the list. And the judge said, go to jail, in effect. Now, there was an argument. I, I was arguing and invoking the spirit of Christmas and forgiveness and so forth but it fell on deaf ears. <laughs> I wanted him to know, as anybody else to know in the same situation, that absent uh, a justification, uh, that they must answer the questions of the legislature uh, or stand committed until they do. And uh, that's elemental. He was sentenced to jail for one year, or until he purged himself of contempt by providing the attorney general with the list. As he was led out of the courthouse and off to jail, a crowd of supporters gathered outside, saying, America. And he could have been kept in jail uh, for the rest of his life. I mean, the, the old saying is, uh, you're in jail, and this was a civil contempt proceeding, not a criminal contempt proceeding. It wasn't punishment. You have the uh, key to the jailhouse in your pocket. Produce the list, and you walk out. Willard Uphouse would spend the next year confined at the Merrimack County Jail. In Concord and Bosquin, there were regular protests and demonstrations calling for his release. Editorials in New Hampshire and across the nation condemned his imprisonment. When Governor Powell traveled to New York to speak about tourism in New Hampshire, he was greeted with pickets condemning the state for holding a political prisoner. Louis Wyman had paid people to go to World Fellowship and report on who came there, what was said at the meetings. So Willard Uphouse, Wyman knew all the information about World Fellowship. All the information that he, that Willard Uphouse was accused of keeping from Wyman, Wyman had. Willard Uphouse didn't go to jail because he did, he kept information from the Attorney General. He went to jail because he defied the Attorney General. Hugo de Gregory had also lost his appeal before the United States Supreme Court. On June 28, 1960, de Gregory was back in court facing Attorney General Wyman. He was again given immunity. He again refused to answer questions, and for the second time, he was sent to jail. The people I knew in the jail were not there anymore. This was a hard regime. We were put in maximum security areas. I was put in the maximum area. I was totally isolated by myself. I saw a human being five minutes every day when he brought me food. That's a total of I was only allowed to walk up and down the car in front of my cell, back and forth. That's all I could do. And um, the second, the first night I was in jail, by the way, I hear a voice calling me. And I wonder where it's coming from. It's Hugo, Hugo. And I listened very carefully. I finally realized it's coming from the elevator, from the uh, ventilated doctors in the cell. It's Willard Uphouse, and he's welcoming me to Boscow in jail as a fellow prisoner. De Gregory's attorney was able to get the state Supreme Court to grant bail again while they pursued a new appeal to the United States Supreme Court. He was released on July 19th. Willard Uphouse, however, remained imprisoned. As the sentence neared completion, Wyman announced that he would seek another contempt charge if Uphouse still refused to provide the list. As far as I was concerned, until he responded to the question, answered who was there, he would simply stay there. It's up to him. He had the keys in his pocket. Anyway, uh, Bob uh, uh, Reno um, 
went to Judge Grant early in December and uh, said to him, in effect, Judge, this thing has gone on long enough. Um, Christmas will be here soon. This guy is either is going to die in jail, and he won't give up the list. Do you want that on your conscience? If, if uh, you agree, we'll take him out of jail and get him out of the state, and that'll be an end of the matter. And uh, Judge Grant bought the idea. So we went up there, I think it was on a, a Sunday morning, and uh, got up house, I think it was my car, as a matter of fact, and uh, we rode down to, uh, he was released from jail. And uh, I think Wyman was in the process of asking uh, that he be uh, sentenced again Wyman for another didn't year. didn't know this was going on. Well, it, I don't think so. No, that's right. Uh, I don't think that he knew what was going on. Uh, at least officially, he was. Uh, he had let it be known that he was going to take the position that he should stay in jail until he gave up the list. The case against Willard Uphouse ended with his release in December 1960, though he continued to spend his summers at World Fellowship Center through the 1970s. No subsequent action against him was ever undertaken by the Attorney General's office. On February 2nd, 1961, Lewis Wyman resigned as Attorney General of New Hampshire. However, his departure did not bring to an end the state's investigation of subversive activities. On October 23rd, 1961, Hugo de Gregory was again the loser in a ruling by the United States Supreme Court. The state seemed content at having just won the case, and even though de Gregory's bail was revoked in March of 1962, no action was taken against him. But in the fall of 1963, Attorney General William Maynard issued another subpoena for de Gregory to appear before him. They called me to court, and I, they asked me the one question, are you a member of the Communist Party? I said, no. That's all I said. And the judge says, well, you have freed yourself of contempt. Meanwhile, the state got up and said, we want to ask him more questions. My attorney got up and said, you can't do that. He was up, he was on contempt on the one charge, one question. He's answered, he should be free. And the judge finally agreed to let me go home. That I was free. The contempt was over. I purged myself. For the first time in nine years, I was a free man. I was not on the subpoena, not on nothing. We went home, we celebrated brought out the wine, we toasted our victory. It felt good. It felt good for wow. two days, and then the subpoena came again. Yep. Another subpoena. And I will never understand to this day why after nine years, the state of New Hampshire decided it had to continue another three years of harassment. Attorney General Maynard issued yet another subpoena, this time asking de Gregory about his activities in the Communist Party prior to 1951. De Gregory refused once again to answer, and once again was found in contempt. And by the way, the New Hampshire statute of limitations, even if I had testified, and let's say I had incriminated myself, I confessed to all kinds of crimes, they couldn't prosecute me because the statute of limitations had run out. So not only was the, infinite, the questioning moot, you know, irrelevant, but even from, if, if it involved any criminal activity or any violation, they couldn't even, it was totally irrelevant in that sense too. Because, but the New Hampshire Supreme Court upheld the authority of the Attorney General. That they did have the right to ask these questions, and that's what I took to the United States Supreme Court. It took another two years to work its way through the system, but on April 6, 1966, nearly 12 years after he was first called into the Attorney General's office, Hugo de Gregory was, for the third time, the subject of a ruling by the United States Supreme Court. This time the court ruled 6-3 in favor of Hugo de Gregory. And largely on grounds that the Attorney General made no showing whatsoever that there was a threat of any sort to New Hampshire. The Supreme Court said, you simply can't delve into this guy's history. You've got to show, even by the terms of your own mandate, Attorney General, you've got to show that there is relevance to the information you're seeking. And there's simply no showing here that there's any, any threat to, to the state of New Hampshire of any kind coming from anywhere, let alone Hugo de Gregory. I stood my ground when I felt my ground had to be, you know, I, had to, I had to be there to do it. I was given a choice. I, didn't, I was given no choice. I either had to capitulate or stand up, and I took the only decent choice I could take. 
and that was to defend my rights, and in defending my rights, to defend everybody's rights. With the ruling for Hugo de Gregory, the New Hampshire investigation of subversive activities unofficially came to an end. De Gregory and his wife Louise, free of fighting investigations, adopted and raised six children. They now live in St. Petersburg, Florida, a few blocks away from their good friend, Ruth Uphouse, widow of Willard Uphouse. Uphouse continued as director of the World Fellowship Center until 1969. In the 1970s, he moved to St. Petersburg and with Ruth McLennan founded Amity House, a community peace and fellowship center. In 1982, Willard Uphouse died at the age of 92. Lewis Wyman went on to serve five terms in the United States Congress, but narrowly lost in his bid for the United States Senate to John Durkin in 1975. In 1978, he was appointed an associate justice to the New Hampshire Superior Court. In 1967, the New Hampshire Supreme Court was asked by the governor and council to look again at the state's subversive activities law. In a non-binding advisory opinion based on subsequent rulings by the United States Supreme Court, they found that it was no longer constitutional. However, no further action has ever been taken to remove it from the laws of New Hampshire. Now, during the past 45 minutes, you have been witnessing only the surface manifestation of an extensive operation by the communists, which in many phases is subtle, takes the form of articles, letter-writing campaigns, and a wide range of other smear activities. Not for the purpose of improving the investigative techniques of congressional committees, and not for the purpose of defending civil liberties as they would have you believe, but for the avowed objective of destroying the Committee on Un-American Activities and our nation's entire security program. You have seen communism in action, the same communism which is, at this instant, attempting to devour the world through subversion, revolution, deceit, sabotage, and vicious propaganda. You have, through these films, seen communism with its mask ripped off, with its sweet facade uncovered, and its hard, bitter, and determined core revealed. 